All right, as you guys prepare for the chapter eight test, I thought I would take some time and show you some extra multiple choice review problems uh, that might look more similar to the types of questions that you will see on the test. Now, what I will need you to do is once I show you a question, if you want to try it on your own before you see me do the answer and explain the answer, then you need to pause the video. So I will let you know, you know, I'll read through the problem, um, I'm, yeah, I'll go ahead and read through the problem. And then I'll tell you to pause, um, do the problem. Once you think you got the answer, go ahead and press play and resume from there. And we will do that for each question. So the first question says a random sample of 900 individuals has been selected from a large population. It was found that 180 are regular users of vitamins. Thus the proportion of the regular users of vitamins in the population is estimated to be 0 0.20. The standard error of this estimate is approximately. Now if you would like to try this problem on your own, pause the video at this time. Otherwise, I'm going to explain now. So the standard error of the estimate, that is really from last chapter, uh, since we are doing um, a proportion level question here, because here we have the proportion. So I really want to find what is sigma sub p hat. And the formula for that was the square root of p hat times 1 minus p hat all over my sample size. Now, my sample size are my 900 individuals here. So this is n. Now the 180 is not my p hat. The p hat is the 180 out of 900, which was given as this value, basically 2 tenths. So when I figure this out, I can go ahead and use 0 0.2, 0 0.20 times 1 minus 0 0.2 over 900. And if I throw that into my calculator, square root 0.2 times basically 0.8 divided by 900, do, 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 I get 0 0.013 repeating, which matches up closely to D. Next up on our list, number two. A traffic consultant wants to estimate the proportion of cars on a certain street that have more than two occupants. She stands at the side of the road for two hours on a weekday afternoon and flips a coin each time a car approaches. If the coin comes up heads, she counts the number of occupants in the car. After two hours, she has counted 103 cars, 15 of which had more than two occupants. Which condition for constructing a confidence interval for a proportion has she failed to satisfy? Now, uh, you might say, well, she wasn't really doing a, a random sample. She was just letting cars come to her. She was kind of doing a convenience sample. But if you think about it, um, she used a random tool here, a coin, that let her decide if some, if a car approached her, she was going to randomly decide if she was going to count it or not. So this does kind of represent a random sample. Okay. Um, let's see. So she counted 103 cars, 15 of which had more or had more than two occupants. Okay. So we could say this is our p hat, 15 out of 103, which is approximately. 0.1456. Now, is n greater than or equal to 30? Basically, this would meet, well, really wouldn't meet anything in a proportion problem. Um, so this really isn't something to satisfy that she hasn't failed. So it's definitely the wrong one. Is n times p greater than or equal to 10? Um, well, if I took n, which is my 103, and I multiplied it by 15 over 103, those would cancel, and is this greater than or equal to 10? Yeah, it checks. Um, even, even if I did this, 103 
and then 1 minus 15 over 103, uh, I still will get, let's see, basically I need to take 103 minus 15, and that's going to give me, what, 88? That's what this number will be, which is definitely greater than or equal to 10. Um, so it's neither one of those. The sample is less than 10% of the population. Well, the number of cars that approach a, what they say exactly, or no, let's say, a traffic is almost estimated, blah, 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 that have more than two occupants. Well, there's really unlimited number that's going on here. So it doesn't really seem like that meets the condition. So if we get to E, the data is a simple random sample from the population of interest. Well, we already kind of talked about the, the coin allowed her to do something randomly, um, but it states here that she stands at the side of the road for two hours on a weekday afternoon. Now, two hours on a weekday afternoon. Does that represent... Um, can we say that it accurately represents the population of all times? And I would say no. If we wanted to do more of all times, we might want to consider, well, during a week period, maybe we randomly select times to go to this busy street or this certain street and cal or not calculate, but collect data. Okay, so this was really a convenient sample, not just because she had the cars come up to her, but she went there on her own terms and collected data during these specific hours. So this doesn't really meet the criteria for all hours of all the day or of all weekdays or of the whole week. So it is a simple random sample in a way, uh, but it doesn't really cover our population of interest. So this is the one. This is our answer for number two. And this one's kind of a tricky one. I don't blame you if you kind of doubt what I'm saying in here. Uh, but really, if you just use process of elimination, eliminate these that definitely were satisfied or didn't need to be satisfied, like an A, you know, you can move on. Number three. A polling organization announces that the proportion of American voters who favor congressional term limits is 64%, with a 95% margin of error, or a 95% confidence margin of error of 3%. Which of the following statements is a correct interpretation of 95% confidence? Now, this is one thing that I've caught you guys kind of messing up on. Interpreting the confidence level itself versus interpreting the confidence interval and the interval would be created by these two numbers 64% plus or minus 3% okay that's not what it's asking for here it's not looking to interpret you know all the way from 61% up to 67% it's asking you to interpret what does the 95% mean so if the poll were conducted again in the same way there's a 95% chance we said anytime they use the 95% to talk about probability, this is not correct. There's a 95% probability. Wrong, wrong. Can't use it that way. If the poll were conducted again the same way, there's a 95% probability. Wrong, no, I don't think so. D. Among 95% of the voters, between 61 and 67% favor term limits. This Now, this one doesn't talk about probability, so you might consider it, but this really isn't, again, a good interpretation of the 95%. It's not that 95% of our voters fall in our one kind of unique confidence interval. That is wrong as well, which leads us to the correct answer that none of these are the correct way. Now, the interpretation of the 95% is this, that if we were to take many, many random samples from our population, that approximately 95% of them would capture the true proportion of American voters who favor congressional term limits. That would be the correct interpretation of the 95% confidence level. Number four. Suppose the poll in the previous question was conducted by email 
and those conducting the survey were concerned about the possibility of undercoverage, since some people do not use email or have filters that block mass emails. Which of the following is the best way for them to correct for this source of bias? So we are still talking about the previous example with the congressional term limits. So if you want to pause, pause, otherwise we're going to keep going. Now, um, they are concerned about under coverage, about leaving certain people in the population out. Okay, which means that our estimate, that 64% that we discussed, is probably going to be um, an underestimate because we are leaving out certain people in the population, which may increase that number. Um, so, we mentioned before that if they don't take a random sample, it depends really on how that sample was taken. And if there's any type of sampling technique which is going to provide you know, a high amount of bias, and we usually said like a volunteer, like a call-in poll or something, was going to produce a large amount of bias, under coverage is a type of bias that it will throw off our data, okay? Now, if they just said, we took a sample, and you might go, you know what, they didn't say it was random, but they didn't say, you know, that it was a voluntary response, that it was under coverage, uh, you know, if they only contacted people a certain way that I would leave out parts of my population. If they leave it very, very open-ended, basically, you could say, yeah, you know, we're, we're going to take a risk on it. We'll go ahead and calculate. Proceed with caution. But in this case, you know what, out of all these examples here, or all these options, which one would be the best one, honestly? A. Throw the sample out. Do it all over again. Okay? Don't do it by email. Try to make it more random. Try to cover your population better. Okay? You can try these other things, but every time you do this, you're going to be making your interval wider uh, or narrower, away or not really away, but you're still going to be focused on an incorrect estimate due to the under coverage. Number five, to assess the accuracy of a laboratory scale, the standard weight that is known to weigh one gram is repeatedly weighed a total of n times, and the mean x bar of the weighings is computed. Suppose the scale readings are normally distributed with unknown mean mu and standard deviation 0.01 grams. How large should n our sample size be so that a 95% confidence interval for mu has a margin of error of 0 0.0001? Now the first thing to recognize here is that we need to talk about just the margin of error formula. Okay, And do we talk about the proportion or the mean type? Well, we are talking about Where's the word? Where's the word? Mean in here. We're talking about mean. No word about proportions. So that means we get to use, and this is the really one and only time that we get to use Z instead of T in a mean level problem, is with this formula. So now we just plug in the numbers that we know here. So we want the margin of error to be 0 0.0001, and this isn't a percent. This is just an actual number here. Now the z-score for a 95% confidence interval, that means that if we drew a quick normal curve, we're meaning 95% in the middle, which means we've got 2.5% in a tail. So in your calculator, you do inverse norm, 0.025, and that should give you our 1.96, which is basically about two standard deviations. Sigma, they had to give us this. This is just kind of a, maybe a best estimate type thing. So 0 0.01 divided by the square root of n, which is what we're trying to figure out. So now, algebraically solving for this. Um, this is one little trick I said I would do. I would say, let's put that 1.96 up top with the 0.01, all to make this one big fraction. And then I said, let's make the margin of error over 1 into a fraction. And then the kind of an algebraic shortcut is to take a denominator of one fraction and the numerator of another fraction, and we are allowed to kind of flip-flop those two things. So then in the end, I have the square root of n now equals 1.96 times 0 0.01 divided by 0 0.0001. 
And then to get rid of my square root here, I'm going to square both sides. So this is what I need to put into my calculator. So I've got 1.96 times 0 0.01 divided by 0 0.0001. I get that number, and I'm going to square it. And I get a rather large number here, 38,416. That is how many times I need to weigh a one kilogram mass to ensure a margin of error that is 0 0.0001. That's a lot of times. Next up, number six. Which of the following has the highest probability randomly selecting a value between negative 2 and 2 from the standard normal distribution, negative 2 and 2 on a t distribution with 4 degrees of freedom, negative 2 and 2 with a t distribution of 20 degrees of freedom, less than negative 2 or greater than 2 from a standard normal distribution, uh, less than negative 2 or greater than 2 from a t distribution with 20 degrees of freedom. So if you want to pause and kind of think about this one, knock yourself out. Otherwise, I'm going to continue. Now, if we're talking about distributions here, one thing to remember is the normal distribution, the standard normal distribution, is always the tallest of all the distributions of, well, there's only one standard normal, but compare it to all the t distributions with all its various degrees of freedom. The t, or the normal distribution is always the tallest, and it has the smallest tails here. Okay, so for example, this might be a standard normal distribution. Now, uh, the higher the degrees of freedom in a t distribution, the closer it looks like a standard normal curve. It's not as tall, so it might be a little under, and it's going to have a little bit fatter tails compared to the normal curve. So it might, this might look like our t-distribution with 20 degrees of freedom. Okay, so I got these color-coded here. And then we had one other different one, a t-distribution with 4 degrees of freedom. Well, the smaller the degrees of freedom get, the shorter the peak is. And the bigger, the wider the tails are. So it might look something along the lines of this. I know it's not very symmetric looking in there. Okay. So here, right down the middle, this is where the mean would equal zero. And if we're talking about uh, between negative two and two, those just mean standard deviations. Those are like z scores or t scores, if you will. So two standard deviations, we'll say, is right here. Here's two standard deviations below. Here's, let's say, is two standard deviations above. Now, if we were talking about a standard normal curve, and we want to be in between two standard deviations, well, according to the empirical rule, that's about 95%. Okay? So we know that this, between negative 2 and 2 on a standard normal curve, that's about 95%. Okay? Now, if we talked about maybe this t distribution with 4 degrees of freedom, well, do you think that this area, well, let me get my highlighter here, let's grab this color. Here is the area, and let's do one more thing. Let's get a horizontal axis here. Do you think the area underneath the normal curve, so here's 95% basically, do you think the area between negative 2 and 2 with the four degrees of freedom t distribution, that this is going to be more or less than 95%. Well, it's less than 95%, right? So we know this answer is going to be less than 95%. And the same thing is going to be true about the t distribution with 20 degrees of freedom. We're talking about this much shading, which isn't as much for the standard normal curve. So we know this answer is going to be less than 95%. So we know b and c definitely don't have the higher probability out of A, B, and C. So far it's A. Now D, a value less than negative 2 or greater than 2 from a standard normal distribution. So if we go back to our blue curve here. 
So they really mean down here and up here. Well, if 95% is in the middle, they're really wanting to know how much is in the tails. Well, that's only 5%. So that's definitely not bigger than 95%. So this answer was 5%. And if we wanted to talk about uh, in the T distribution with 20 degrees of freedom, well, we're still talking about this much and this much. Do we think that's going to be any more than 95%? I highly, highly doubt it. So I would say my answer would be A, 95%. I believe that's going to be the highest probability. Now, if you wanted to take a more general approach to this, if you wanted to actually calculate stuff, you could do that. So for example, between negative 2 and 2 with the standard normal, well for A, you could just use normal CDF to figure out what is that probability. Lower bound negative 2, upper bound 2. And a standard normal just has a mean of 0 and standard deviation 1, which you don't have to put in. Okay. Now, normal CDF doesn't really apply to t-distributions. If you look at underneath normal CDF, there's um, inverse norm. And if you have a newer calculator, there's inverse t. Oh, I see a big bug in my basement. I need to go kill it. I'll be right back. Okay, bug killed. Anyway, uh, below inverse norm and inverse T, if you have it, there's T, PDF, and T, CDF. Well, we're going to use T, CDF, just like we always use CDF for normal. So we could say T, CDF, and this is something we haven't used in class, uh, but we will get to. But it kind of works the same way as normal CDF. You got lower bound, upper bound, but then T was different because we had degrees of freedom. So the third number you put in are the degrees of freedom. So you could put in four and figure out what that number is. For C, you could do the same thing. T CDF, negative two, two, but we have 20 degrees of freedom. For D, we want to be less than negative two and greater than positive two. So this is really, you could do it as two separate TCDFs from negative infinity to negative two, and then add to it from two to infinity. Or we could use the complement rule and say we want to take one, all 100% underneath that curve, and subtract away what's in the middle between negative two and two. And that'll leave us with what's in the tails. So let's see. Oh, no, D. My bad. didn't realize we went back to standard normal. So we could do 1 minus normal CDF, negative 2 to 2, and then last but not least for E, now we're back to a T distribution. And so since they want to know the tails, let's subtract out what's in the middle, and that'll give us what's left over for our tails. Oh, what's going on? Negative 2, 2, and if you do all of those, you should find that A should be, and I just want to double check that last one, uh, do, 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 do. 1 minus T CDF negative 2 comma 2 comma, oh I didn't put up my degrees of freedom down there, 20, and I get something that's like 6% for the answer to E. So down here, do, 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 after negative 2 comma 2, I need to put comma, my degrees of freedom. And yeah, that ended up being like 0 0.059. So by far, the greatest probability is A. All right, 7. A 95% confidence interval for the mean reading achievement score for a population of third grade students is 44.2 to 54.2. Suppose you compute a 99% confidence interval using the same data. Which of the following statements is correct? So if you want to pause, pause. If not, let's talk about it. The intervals have the same width. The 99% interval is narrower, or it's wider. Or it could be wider or narrower. It depends on the sample. The answer can't be determined from the information given. Now, we are increasing our confidence from 95 to 99%. And I always think back to, like, the first video uh, from this chapter when I talked about what did it mean to be a hundred 
100% confident. Well, to be 100% confident, I have to choose every possible number. My confidence interval is going to be the widest it will ever be. So if I go from 95 to 99, my interval is going to get wider. And so there's my answer. Now, they did say we're going to use the same data. If they said, suppose you compute a 99% confidence interval using a new set of data, then how would it compare? Or which statement would be correct? Um, I would still say it's still going to be wider because the margin of error is going to be bigger for a 99% confidence interval. Okay, so even if they use the same data or they collected a new sample, as long as it was from the same, uh, the same sample size, the same n, then that would be true. Number eight, what is a critical value t that satisfies the condition that it, the t distribution with eight degrees of freedom has probability 0 0.10 to the right of t? Now, just remember a t distribution kind of looks like a normal. Okay, it's not going to be as tall. The ends are going to be a little bit thicker. So maybe here's our horizontal axis here. Um, so it has probability of basically 10% to the right of this particular value. So we need 10% of the right side to be basically shaded. So I'm just going to estimate, uh, maybe right here. Let's say this is 10%. And this particular value that I've cut off the 90% from the 10%, this is the number I'm trying to figure out right here. Okay, now you can use your calculator, and unfortunately I cannot do this because I do not have a calculator with me, but if you were to do inverse t, and then the tail area, we can use this, 0 0.10, comma, the degrees of freedom, or if your calculator is newer enough, it'll ask you what the uh, area is that you want to consider, 0 0.10, and degrees of freedom, 8. Or if you want to go old school and use the t-table, we can look here. I just need to find, let's see, uh, one tail, 10%, and then go down to 8 degrees of freedom, and there's my t-score, 1.397. And there's 1.397. So there's my answer. So that should be the same answer you get from this right there. And the last problem. In preparation for constructing confidence interval for a population mean, it's important to plot the distribution of sample data. Below are stem plots describing samples from three different populations. For which of the three samples would it be safe to construct a t-interval? Okay, so when we do mean problems, okay, Typically, I would say you have to plot your data if you have less than 30 in your sample size. Okay, so the first thing I would look at when considering these three different data sets are the sample sizes. Well, let's see, n equals 20. That's not big enough for the central limit theorem to apply. So, yeah, I would need to graph my data. n equals 19. That's still small n equals 11, smaller. So the central limit theorem cannot help me out with any of these. Okay, so now I really do need to look for two, one of two things. I need to look for strong skewness, or I need to look for outliers. And if either one of those things are present, then I can't do the problem. I can't do T procedures. So if I look at sample X here, you know, if I try to apply a curve to my data, would I consider this strongly skewed? I may. You know, and if I, I could put all this data into a list in my calculator and make a box plot, because I may want to check, is this number, this 0, line 2, is that an outlier maybe? Could it be a potential outlier? Possibly. Because, I mean, look at all your data. It's between 41 and 85. You know, pretend these are test scores. And then you got a person that got a 2%. That seems kind of off. Okay, so I would definitely lean towards that's probably an outlier. So if I was looking at this, I would say I probably wouldn't use T distribution here, a T procedure. Then to the next one, if I try to apply a curve again, would I call that strongly skewed? And you know what? I probably would. Because again, most of our data is here. Now I do have more 
you know extreme values here so maybe two percent is no longer an outlier it may be an outlier but it still stretches out quite a bit there so I probably wouldn't use T procedures with sample Y either now sample Z if I try to apply a curve here I look at that and I go hey that maybe looks kinda skewed it's almost symmetric it's almost normalish looking so would I feel comfortable using T procedures here I absolutely would so this would be the one and only one I would personally use if given the option okay and those are your eight multiple choice bonus questions so hopefully I've answered some questions hopefully you've seen and learned from uh, some additional help here if you have any questions over these you can always email me you can find me on Facebook and message me or you can just ask me the next day in class so hopefully you guys are studying for your test and good luck